need to say something about pre-earth life. And uh, I want to get into that subject, and we'll take the next hour to do that, and I'll try and wind that up there and get back on course and get some of these other things that we need to say into the mill this afternoon. The other day we indicated that that uh, the Pearl Great Price doesn't say anything directly about the earliest stage of life, the primal life, that life that we call intelligence or light of truth. It doesn't say anything about that directly. It does infer it indirectly. When you read Abraham's vision, he says, Now I, Abraham, saw the intelligence that were organized before the world was. And as we indicated the other day, those in, the word intelligence is, is a synonym for spirits, organized spirits. It, the word intelligence is, is not directly a synonym for primal life. He goes on to say, for example, that I beheld that, these, that they were spirits. So that the Pearl Great Price itself, then, directly doesn't say anything about uh, primal life. And you have to go to the Doctrine and Covenants, section 93, in order to pick that one up. And it has three basic statements, and uh, I've learned a little about uh, one of them that I didn't know years ago, and so I'd kind of like to update some things in that sense. But uh, uh, when he talks about intelligences, they were spirits and they were the noble and great ones. Now, these intelligences were organized, and this implies that uh, there was something prior to the organization of spirits. That's, that's the inference. And it's in the Doctrine and Covenants that you have the basic statement on that, and I'd like to turn to section 93 of the <clears throat> Doctrine and Covenants and uh, pick that one up. By the way, section 93 is one of, if not the greatest, revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, particularly when it comes to disclosing basic principles concerning God and man's relationship to God. There are several great revelations, section 76 and section 132 and section 88 and section 93. And I don't know, it's kind of hard to say which is the greatest of them, but section 93 is without peer. Uh, it's, uh, it's that important. It opens so many doors. Uh, into a knowledge and understanding. It's one that you should study enough so that, so that you've almost memorized it, so that you can in your mind say, okay, now how does this word go to you? It's that kind of importance, and it's well worth your time to do that. In verse 29, the Lord says, for example, man was in the beginning with God. Intelligence or the light of truth was not created, neither indeed can be. Now, as you, as you study the meaning of that term in early LDS literature, and the thing I did years ago was to go through early LDS literature, everything Joseph Smith said, everything Brigham Young said, everything Orson Pratt said, everything that anyone said who said they had heard anyone say anything. <laughs> okay? <laughs> And I went through all that, through the journals and through the discourses, with simply the open mind of saying, what does this mean? And then trying to get what light I could get from the Lord on the subject. And uh, the end result was something like this. You pick up the same statement, for example, the similar correlated statement in verse 33. For man is spirit. The elements are eternal. Now, this just brief statement, man is spirit. It doesn't say man is a spirit. It says man is spirit. The primal stuff in you is spirit. Okay? 
And then as you study this point out, you find that that uh, the scriptures teach, and the prophet Joseph and others did, that we're living in a living universe. Every element of the universe has inherent within it inherent properties of life, has within it inherent properties. Some to greater degrees than others, so that Lehi could say that some things are organized to act, and some things only have the capability to be to be organized, to be acted upon. Now, those with the lesser inherent properties are those that pertain to the grosser sphere of substance, what we would call gross matter. The Lord can't start and organize organized life out of gross matter because the properties of life that are there that are needed then to bring that organization into being and to give it meaning and to sustain it, there is not enough to hold it together. But spirit, as a purifying substance, has within it inherent and acquired properties of life. Now, so does gross matter, or can have at least, it's got the potential to it, has in it inherent and acquired properties of life. On a high level, somewhere near to what the Pratts used to say, the capability of mind of man. You're talking about a living universe. You're talking in the doctrine telling us about the earth being alive. It keeps the law of its existence. You're reading meaningfully what uh, the record in Moses says when the earth nauseated, just... Uh, regurgitated in its feelings to the Lord in disgust. How long is this crud going to go on? You see? And it's aware of it. Now, if you think you're out alone back to the shed, if we think that, keep in mind that the Lord might call the earth to bear witness against you on the day of judgment and say, and no one saw me. Yeah, but how do you know no one saw you? See? How do you know? You're living in a living universe. Now, coming down to this point, if you were to take a given particle of spirit, just make a circle out of it, and then put in that given particle of spirit an X to represent the inherent property of life, and you call that inherent property intelligence. And a synonym for that, for that plus then that represents that inherent intelligence, a synonym for that then is light of truth. Now the fact that it's called intelligence implies that it has cognitive power, and it does, that it has the power of thought and of decision, that it has the capability of choice. We may be dealing with rudimentary levels, but it's there. And it's not there because something put it there. It's there because it's inherent. It's as old as God. And if it were not for the fact that we're living in a living universe, there could be no God. Because that's where things start. You see that? All right, so what is the primal life of man? Now, uh, it's, it's, it's this inherent property of life within a particular element of spirit. Now, as the brethren have taught, that uh, there is a gradation of life, even in that primal realm. There are, there are differences in relation to the inherent property, and then, as I've said, there's also acquired one, and I want to get to that a little later, but that may, let me put that into the picture. So that the element is alive, and it's called, in, and so far as that, that level of things that you can, in, in that, uh, should I say, sea of, of life and so forth, and it's individualized, it's not just a blob or a glob, it's, it's individualized, but the, the one that finally becomes this me, that's my ego, that's, that's, uh, that is this my basic core of life and of existence. See? If you go back to a single one, it goes back to that one, 
and that's me. Now, there's more to say on it than that, but that's one feature to it, see? Now, another feature to it is that there is another kind of life that that primal life can acquire by reason of its agency. And the Doctrine and Covenants, section 93, talks about that. Let me just read a few things in relation to it. We're talking now here about that as it applies to Christ, as uh, the only begotten. It says in verse 8, Therefore in the beginning the Word was, and he was the Word, even the messenger of salvation, the light and the redeemer of the world, the spirit of truth. And that's the term I want to center on. The Spirit of Truth who came into the world because the world was made by him. And in him was the life of men and the light of men. And the worlds were made by him, men were made by him, all things were made by him, and through him and of him. And I, John, bear record, and I beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of the Spirit of full of grace and truth, even the Spirit of Truth. Now the Spirit of Truth then is another word for his glory. It's another word for that power that's expressed through the word, the living word, the messenger, the light, the redeemer, the spirit of truth, see? It's that divine thing we call, that thing we call the divine nature. And Jesus has that centered in him, so he is the spirit of truth. Now over here it goes on and says, in verse 26, and the spirit of truth is of God. I, Jesus speaking, am the spirit of truth. And John bore record to me saying, he, Jesus, received a fullness of truth, yea, even of all truth. And then the revelation then extends this thing to us. And it says, and no man receiveth a fullness unless he keepeth his commandments. He that keepeth his commandments receiveth truth and light until he is glorified in truth and knoweth all things. Now, you don't get to be a god by packing one Ph.D. on top of another. The way you get to be a god is to learn the spirit of truth and to go through that formula. You keep the commandments. You meet the challenge of personal discipline. You meet the challenge of true faith. You meet the challenge of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. You meet that challenge, and you meet it honestly, and you meet it as sincerely as you can. And in that process, then, you not only struggle, but you ask the Lord for help, and you covenant with him that if he will help you, you will straighten up and fly right. And you ask him to reveal yourself to yourself so you can see yourself in all your cruddy hues and colors. And I mean that. If you were to take a rag and go out into the barnyard of a dairy barn and sop it in the stuff that's back of the cows as they stand in their manger or out in the yard where they've trampled and then you hold that rag up before the Lord, over like this, to the side. And you say, Lord, in your estimation, with the sense of purity that you have, which is more putrid to you, that or me? Do you know what the answer would be? He would say, you. Now, that's true. I know that's true. That's true. Now, it's a different kind of putridness, but you ask him to reveal yourself. You get to the point where the people of, of King Benjamin got, where they viewed themselves in their own carnal state even less than the dust of the earth. Now, that's demeaning. And I'm not talking about demeaning yourself. I'm not talking about penance. I'm talking about finally seeing ourselves in the light of God's truth. You've got to get down and see the problem. And the fall works on us to that extent, see? And then you've got a preparation to say, wow, well, if that's true, then boy, hey, 
Oh, how great is the nothingness of man, the Book of Mormon prophet put it in. And you come down into the pit. The pit is the broken heart and the contrite spirit. And you say, Lord, is that really true? And he says, yes, that's, that's really true. And you say, wow, that stinks. And he said, I know. What do you think? And it's not a good savor. A good smell. And then you begin to say, Lord, help me change. Now you've seen reality. See, now you've seen reality. Now help me change. You see that? Right, now, when you do that, and you pay that price, then you begin to get the spirit of truth. You, in a sense, then purge yourself. The spirit has to act not just to fill you. The first thing it has to act on is to purge you. It doesn't cram truth in on top of junk. The way it operates is to start by cleansing, and you better work with it in that sense. You don't mix it up like a mulligan. And pack crud and truth into crud, you don't do that. First thing you do is kind of clean out the barn. That's the first thing you do, see? And hose it down. Get things clean. And so one thing you need to do then is ask the Lord to reveal yourself to yourself and persist in it, the way he finally tells you. And then when you get down to reality, down to the hard pan, to the core, to the hard rock of reality, then you see that in this fallen state we're nothing, we're less than the dust of the earth. I don't care what you drive or what you live in or what kind of clothes you wear, you're nothing without Christ. And then you build from that point on up, see, and you grow up in Christ, and you keep working at it to get to there, and you keep at that, and you work and you struggle at it, until you get to that point, and you find a place where you can go and talk with the Lord, and you pray, you walk out and commune with him, and you commune with him honestly on the basis of reality. You see, that's what you do. And uh, you keep the commandments, and then you receive truth and light. You're glorified in truth, and you can know all things. The record of heaven can be there. The truth of all things, the light, the gifts, the power, the revelation, it can be there. And you grow up in Christ. It's an in Christ relationship. It's not a free enterprise relationship. It's an in Christ relationship. Now, having said all of that in this, let me get back to the main thing. Over here in verse 23, the Lord now is talking about man in the beginning, and he says this, Ye were also in the beginning with the Father. That which is spirit even the spirit of truth. Now, that's not talking about the same thing as verse 29. I used to kind of feel they were equated, and they are related, but they're not synonymous. Verse 29 is talking about intelligence or the light of truth, the primal light, taking again this circle. The circle represents the eternal element called spirit. The plus in it represents the inherent property of life. That's intelligence or the light of truth. Now you put an X in it. You put an X in it. And let that represent the acquired spirit of truth, which that primal life received even before spirit birth, because it had cognitive power. And all truth, and the Lord makes that statement in verse 30 as a follow-up of verse 29. Which means that it applies to verse 29. All truth is independent in that sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself and not to be acted upon, as all intelligence also. Otherwise, there is no existence. See? All right, so that primal life was, was, was independent, not independent of God, as some people try to say. Independent in the sphere in which God placed it. And all intelligence, likewise, must be independent, otherwise there can be no existence. That's one of the great truths of the, of the order of the cosmos. It's one of those statements like the Lord said about the two commandments. Love God and love your neighbor, and upon these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. 
Now here's one on which hangs all the law of the cosmic order and all the law of life. It's it, all truth has got to be independent in the sphere in which God has placed it to act for itself and not to be acted upon in all intelligence. Otherwise, there's no commandment. And on this statement hangs the whole orderly cosmos and the whole of existence. You see that? Well, that's so fundamental. It's one of the great fundamental statements in the revelation of God. And so it's independent. And if that primal intelligence is independent in that sphere, independence means that the inherent right of choice it implies then cognitive power, decision power, action. And what does it act on? What does it look for? It looks to God, even then. And it looks to begin to get his divine nature. And that divine nature is called the spirit of truth. And it began to acquire the spirit of truth, even in that stage. And so the Lord says then in section 93, Ye were also in the beginning with the Father. That which is spirit, even the spirit of truth. And then there's a semicolon there. That doesn't end the sentence. And he talks then about truth. And truth, the truth that he's speaking of here now is the truth of the light, of the spirit of truth. It's not a scientific thing in the sense that you're talking about truth in the abstract. It's talking about the truth, it's the spirit of truth that the primal intelligence of man has acquired in the beginning. That's what it's talking about. But he says, and truth is knowledge of things as they are, and as they were, and as they are to come. Now, the word to come, then, is a meaningful term. To come doesn't mean everything in the future. To come means that which is appointed for the future at a given time. God's words are eternal, and he's going to say something tomorrow that he hasn't yet said today. His word is truth. And when he says something tomorrow that he hasn't said today, that's in the record of heaven. That's something now that's to come. That's a creation of truth. It's that which will be, which is to come. And that leaves the future open-ended. You see that? That doesn't mean that the future unfolds according to everything that someone said billions of eternities ago. Things are moving onward, and God's and, and knowledge then or truth is knowledge of things as they are. And God is in and through all things, and he visualizes and sees, and they center in him, and they reveal to him, like Moses looking at the earth and seeing every particle of the earth. Knowledge is things as they are and as they were, and the total past then is in the record of heaven. And it's there, it's right in his, so he can bring that up and it's right in his mind. And then everything has been ordained for the future. Everything has been ordained for the future. Everything that God or some agent who has power to act for him and in his name has ordained for the future, then that is what is to come. And that's in the, the computer also, the celestial record of heaven. You see that? And all of that then is the truth that you're talking about in relation to the spirit of truth, which is now in the same, of it, in the application of it, talking about the primal life of man and what we begin to get even before spirit birth. Now, we said it clearly enough so we can begin to see and understand what it's saying, see? And he says, whatsoever is more or less than this is the spirit of that wicked one. Now, it's not just the, ab uh, the, uh, the abstra abstract principle. Uh, truth is a spirit. Truth is a substance. Read section 84. The word of the Lord is truth. And that which is truth is light. And that which is light is spirit, even the spirit of Jesus Christ. Truth is a substance. It's that purifying substance we call the Spirit. And it's called the Spirit of Truth. And even before spirit birth, even before spirit birth, the primal life of the individual then, the plus here uh, in, in the circle, had the capacity to receive the Spirit of Truth. And there's an interaction, an interrelationship, if you'll receive it, between those kinds of primal intelligences that had the nature of male and those kinds that had the nature of female, even at that point, and in inner relationship. Now, that's a beautiful story. It goes on to higher things that I hope someday maybe the Lord will give us more information on, or at least let us teach what we know. But there's things there, then, that deal now with the nature of life. 
See, the primal nature of life in section 93 is called intelligence or the light of truth. Now, that is true of both men and of women, isn't it? doesn't make a distinction. But it's light of truth. Now, truth shines. As Doctrine and Covenant section 88 says, which truth shines? It shines. And truth and light is the radiance of truth. And so your interest can be either in the substance of truth or in the radiance of truth. The substance is the executive stuff. The radiance is the nurturing, the application stuff. Can I put it down? And there are those primal intelligences then, I suspect, that place primary emphasis and attention on the substance of truth. And that's executive, and that's male in character. And then there were those then who placed primary emphasis. They still had this, the truth, but they placed primary emphasis on the light, on the radiance, on the application, on the nurturing program. By nature, then, they fall into the female category. It's the difference between the light of Christ, which is really more feminine in its origin, and the power of the Holy Ghost. One is executive, the other is quickening and nurturing. See? When you begin to study that revelation and bring out, you see how important a lot of those things are. See, Now what I'm saying then is that the, uh, the spirit of truth then, this, 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 uh, this primal period of time was an era, and there was agency, and there was the basis for growth and development. There was a basis for interrelationship in various ways, I think, between male and female back there, because you can't have, you can't have light without truth, and you can't really have truth without giving the light and then coming back and getting the radiance of truth and the benefits of it, see. And it's that kind of thing that, that establishes the LDS, I think, view of man and of woman as being truly one flesh. And the word flesh, then, might not just be the, the, the physical stuff, it's the one substance. They are one flesh. And they're not created to be two people who finally commit matrimony and join together and live with each other. They're, content, they're you know, created to be one. They are created to be one. And a man who is a true man of God enhances the life of his wife and makes her more beautiful and makes her more more womanly and feel more the female dignity of what a true woman should be if he is a true man and if she is a true woman true woman in the character of the spiritual renewal uh, figure of womanhood and she is true in the sense then of the great destiny of life and open and not contracted but nevertheless basing your life on, on truth and on what it really ought to be and its dignity its character then and she gives herself to her husband having received truth and then run it through the female spectrum and given it back to him uh, to enhance the glory of both of them then she becomes his glory and, and they become one and they have the dignity of true union in Christ, see. Now, that's what marriage ought to be. And it's not that, then. It's not really a marriage. It's cohabitation of some kind. See? But the man, as a man, makes his wife more womanly, and the woman, as a woman, makes her husband more manly. And it's not just a matter of having equal rights so that everyone can be an executive in some corporation, not how many females in the state senate and, and all of that kind of thing. It's you create both then to be one. All right, now they were born then as spirits. And the firstborn of in that spirit family for this eternity is that noble and dignified person we call Jehovah. And he came to spirit birth by merit. He came to spirit birth by merit. And he came to spirit birth by the foreknowledge of the Father, that he, being the firstborn, would then move on to become the only begotten, 
not just in the flesh, but the only begotten, the one who partakes of the divine nature, and the one who has perfection in his life to the point where he can walk the path of rectitude and of virtue and of holiness without deviation. And so the Father makes covenant with him and says, Now, if you will do this, if you will do this, then our relationship will be solid and I will be in you and you can be in me. And I will center my truth first in you and you will become the light and the life of all other of my spirit children. But they don't have, at the point of spirit birth, the qualities that you have. Some of them are maimed in various ways. And I'm not talking about being physically maimed. Some of them have got a short leg or a short arm or something. So that I'm going to infuse into them all the attributes that I can at spirit birth. And that's, that's part of spirit birth. It's not merely to organize this central primal intelligence with other, uh, at, other elements of spirit to make the, the thing up here, uh, the mind, the eternal mind, and then to organize the whole body now as, as a, uh, an organized body of spirit elements with a little finger that's got inherent and acquired properties so that the whole then can act in union, quickened by the spirit, see. Uh, that's, that's, that's the organization of spirit birth, see. Spirit birth is not a tabernacling process. Spirit birth is an organizational process. Abraham says, I saw the intelligences that were organized. Spirit birth is taking that central primal ego intelligence, organizing others uh, with it, to make the central organization of the system and then the physical and, and then the organs of the body, of the spirit body, on down through to where you have an organized spirit birth uh, being that's born. And each, each element within that organized spirit has inherent and acquired properties of life, but not in the same degree. And they are placed under the direction of that central primal kingdom, and he has got a kingdom now over which he can rule in righteousness. You see that? Now that's an organizational process. And then as you go through the first estate and you meet the challenges there and then you come into the second estate, you already have a fully matured spirit with hands and legs and mouth and ears and eyes and all of those organs of the body. And now it's a matter of adding upon. They should be added upon. And so physical birth then is a tabernacling process. You see that? Creating then the physical embryo then to be part of that organized spirit. And then you go on and rebirth, the new birth, then is not only a forgiveness of sins, it's an endowment process. It's endowing then you with further with the divine nature. And you then need to grow up in Christ and partake of his righteousness and put away your own narrow righteous views. And his righteousness consists of the spirit of revelation, the revelation of divine truth and virtue and holiness. His righteousness consists of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. His righteousness consists of the love of the Father given through Christ to us. And that's a little different than going out and doing the smorgasbord thing and picking out, I'll believe in this truth and this truth has been revealed. And I'm going to make all these things uh, the basis of my life and become a great personality and a, and a free enterprise in, in the kingdom of God. Now, you have to get in Christ and he's got to get in you. And you have got to partake of his righteousness and repent of your own righteousness and grow up in him. You've got to do that. Now, rebirth, then, is that endowment process, see? And that's the basis, then, of, of the plan of life. Now, Christ being the firstborn, then, enters into covenant with the Father. I will keep your commandments right down the line and live a perfect walk before you. And I will keep that relationship with you so that you are in me and I am in you. Then the father says, now, on that basis, I want to have a bunch of other kids. And I want those other children to get everything that justice and equity and righteousness requires them to have. 
So if you will keep that law perfectly before me so that I don't have to cast you out like I'm going to have to cast Adam out of the Garden of Eden, if you will keep that law so that there's no separation of you from me, and I center my truth first in you so that you become my only begotten, and that's where he began, the only begotten, see, right there from that point, the only one to partake of these things after the experience of spirit birth. Then you take those truths that I give you and you disseminate them to the rest of my spirit children and do it equitably. Do it equitably. And then you also take care of the demands of repentant sin. And if you'll do those two things, if you give them my truth, and if you'll take care of the demands of repentant sin for them, I will give them to you to be your children. You see that? And so the Father gives us, gave us to Christ. As Jesus said, thine they were, John 17, but thou gavest them to me. You see that? Now that process then exists here back there, and uh, it extends on here into the physical, so that when we wake up again out of the fallen state and we're born again, we are born into Christ's family, see? But if you study the scriptures clearly and plainly, you'll find that it existed before. You'll find that it existed before, see? All right, so Christ then becomes the firstborn. And uh, we began to get on our way, and we began then to experience the relationships of pre earth life. And you finally then get to the point where uh, there's some maturity. It doesn't mean that everyone comes up to the same level. A lot of people just sit around and watch celestial TV all their lives. The celestial earth, <laughs> which is the German thumb. And they didn't apply themselves. And uh, they were those then who didn't really internalize the Spirit. A lot of times we say we didn't have to walk by faith back there, and that's a bunch of bunk. You say we come to this earth that we have to walk by faith, and we do have to walk by faith there. But you can live next door to Jesus, as many people in the land of Palestine did, and you can be as dead as a mackerel until you open your heart. You don't even know who he is until you see him by the spirit of revelation. You can have him available and see him administering in the offices of the pre-earth world. You can do all of that and know that in external sense. But until you get down to bed the bedrock of faith where the spirit of revelation there is there to tell you who he is, Thou art the Christ, the living Son of the living God, as Peter says. He, until you do that, then you don't know who he is, and you had to live by faith in pre earth life. You had to learn the processes of faith. And there were those who learned those processes and became great and noble ones, and Abraham calls them great and noble. And Abraham indicates, like we said yesterday, that they were gods. They were those then who acquired the spirit and glory and power in great degree and then were given the holy priesthood and the keys and the powers to develop it in other people. And they became gods. They became gods in the sense of receiving the divine nature and then in being the source through whom it was given to others. See? And you had that kind of thing. And then there were those who just... Uh, uh, waltzed around and playboyed around and, and didn't do and yet had some kind of moral integrity and all of that and they were really way down the line, see. Someone asked a question here of the, how about the third part and I, I don't dare answer all that but I'll give you at least some of the basic ideas on that. When it came there though to the grand, to the, the getting ready then for mortality and we're thinking of this now in the context of this eternity, not in the context merely of this earth. Joseph Smith says again here in the teachings, as he talks about it, uh, the head God called together the gods and sat in grand council to bring forth the world. 
The grand counselor sat at the head in yonder heavens and contemplated the creation of the worlds, plural, which were created there at time, see. And so to start this whole thing now in relation to the second estate, then you called the priesthood leaders from the spirit worlds, where these spirits had been transplanted and on which they lived. As part of you perhaps said, after we'd lived for a while in the immediate environs of the Father, we were transplanted on spirit world that had been organized for, for us, see? And uh, that's where the first estate took place. You didn't tear up the Father's furniture in the war in heaven. The war in heaven took place on these various spirit worlds, see? And uh, as you get things in gear, then you call a great council. As the prophet Joseph says, said, it was held on Kohar. And the priesthood leaders, the gods, the gods of these various spirit worlds met together in a great convocation. And they get, got, met together there in order to propose a plan and a program to get us a physical body and to get us back into God's presence with a physical organism. Now there had been those in the first estate who had not only been deficient in their development, but had become Babylon in character. You read the twelfth chapter of the book of Revelation in the inspired revision, and uh, it makes some interesting uh, statements there. Let me just uh, take a minute with you on those. It is a vision given to John the Revelator of the war in heaven as a prototype or a type and a shadow of the warfare that will take place in the latter day leading to the redemption of Zion, that era of warfare that Nephi saw, beginning with first Nephi, when the multitudes and the Gentiles and come against the saints to make war against God. And uh, the church is cleansed, the church is bombarded, and this warfare against Zion has two major divisions. We'll get to that in the discussion of the second coming tonight. Uh, the divisions of it are, then, that the first onslaught is made against Zion, just like Nephi saw in 1 Nephi 14 particularly around verse, and in verse 14 of of 1 Nephi 14, he says, I saw the power of God in great glory that it rested upon the church of the Lamb of God and upon the covenant people of the Lord, see. That's where Zion begins to get sanctified. And that's where Zion begins to rise to be an end Zion and to be a standard to the world, see. And Zion, while she's bombarded and the warfare is made against her, Zion basically holds. A lot of the saints melt away, And there'll be thousands, literally, then, who either fall away or go into apostasy. And Isaiah talks about a tenth that finally get through. Then he refers other references, a tenth to a tenth of a tenth. So there's only a small group, then, who finally get through and do what they really ought to do. And this is the warfare against Zion. But those who... Ride the Colorado Rapids in the leaky bathtub with a broken oar and, and no rudder, and have faith in the Lord and come through and get sanctified and get the endowments of the Spirit. That's where you finally get back to Jackson County. That's where you build Zion. You see that? And uh, <clears throat> then after Zion is built, and after the seventh seal is opened, and after the 144,000 are called, which is done just before the opening of the seventh seal, and after they do their work of ministry, which is the half hour of silence in heaven, which computes the time on earth is about 21 years plus, when they do their work and they gather people into the church of the firstborn, then Christ comes to his temple to put the capstone on, to actually make them kings and priests in fact. And you get into the period where the Adam and Diamond Council is held. And about that time, in that era of time, then the second phase of the warfare takes place. And Lucifer scratches his head and says, well, if I can't shut Zion off, I'm going to shut off Jerusalem. And so he gathers all nations to Jerusalem. And there's a big battle there. 
And the city capitulates, finally, after three and a half years or so, and uh, is overrun. And while they're stopped to celebrate and to rejoice and to have their wine and their liquor and all that, then Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives. And that changes the battle program. And the Jews are redeemed. And the temple is rebuilt. And the program that's been set up in Zion is established in Jerusalem, including the government of God. And the Jews are brought in, and they're given the blessings of the temple, of the holy order, the sealing powers, the endowment of glory. And when that is done, and that will only take a few months, toward, uh, as that gets through, then Christ makes his appearance in glory and power in the clouds of heaven. And the righteous, the church of the firstborn, which now includes the Jews, will be caught up to meet him. The resurrection of the righteous have taken place before. So this warfare period then has two divisions to it. It has the warfare against Zion and then the warfare against Jerusalem. Now in light of that, let me read the inspired division of the book of Revelation. If you've got the Bible looking in the back in the Joseph Smith section, the inspired division section, under, under uh, Revelation chapter, uh, what's not 14, pardon, it's chapter 12. What am I thinking about? Present, I'm losing the marbles. <clears throat> he says, And there appeared a great sign in heaven. Note this, in the likeness of things on the earth. Now there's the key. That's not in the King James. In the likeness of things on the earth. Of the likeness of things on the earth of the warfare against Zion with the two with the two campaigns. You see that? And you get those two campaigns in and see them clearly, and then read chapter 12. All right, and he said, In the likeness of things on the earth, a woman clothed with the, the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And the woman, being with child, cried travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations, with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and his throne. And there appeared another sign in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. And note it doesn't say a third. It says a third part. A third is a fraction. A part is a division, however large it may have been. It drew a third part, you said, of sinner's statement in section 29 of the Doctrine of Covenants. And again, it's the third part. We have read that so loosely that we think of one-third people. And it doesn't say that. It simply doesn't say that. His tail drew a third part of the... Uh, uh, stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was delivered, ready to be devou to devour her child after it was born. And he goes on to say, the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore years. Now, the King James translation puts that days. Joseph changed it to years. A lot of people, if I can say parenthetically here, think this has to do with the Christian apostasy. If it had to do with the Christian apostasy and the inspired revision is correct, which it is, then you would have to say the church that Christ established was in the wilderness for 1,260 years before 1830, and that would put it back to 570 A.D., and that would mean that the Christian church that Christ and the apostles established continued for 570 years, and that's several years after the Nicene Council. And the end conclusion on that is this doesn't pertain to the Christian apostasy. This is talking about the scene that took place in spirit life, in the war in heaven. That's what it's talking about. Now, with that clarification, let's move on. All right, he says, 
And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore years. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the devil and the de dragon, and his angels fought against Michael. And the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God. The church of God where? Not in this temple state. The church of God that was built up and existed in the first estate. Okay? They're talking about that. And uh, the dragon prevailed not against Michael, neither the child, neither the woman, which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of God and his Christ. And the kingdom there is the political kingdom. The man-child is the government of God. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations. What nations? Those in the spirit world in the first estate. Now that is very revealing. It's a very revealing statement. It tells us about the first estate of things that we as Latter-day Saints haven't picked up on yet. Now, first of all, there was a church established there. You're not sitting right in the immediate environs of the Father, or you can have family home evening and have the gospel right there all along. You have things going along for a while, and finally people begin to get awakened in their faith, and they begin then to teach the gospel and to build up a church. And the devil doesn't like that. He doesn't like that a bit. And that church, then, is designed to bring forth and give birth to a political kingdom. Now, why? Well, John Taylor explained it and said simply this, that this, is a, this political kingdom is revelatory, it's governed by the power of God, and it's based upon the revelatory powers of the Spirit. It's based on people who have those things in their lives, and then you invite the non-member to come in and enjoy the privileges on the basis of the covenant of liberty. They make the covenant of liberty, they can come. But the basic structure then requires people who are knit together by the powers of the Spirit and who know the processes of revelation. And this requires then the church to exist, and it requires the church then to give birth to the political kingdom. And that scenario began to be developed in pre-earth life. And the devil didn't like that. And he then comes out and makes war, and he's ready to devour that child to kill that political system, to squelch it when it's born. And it's caught up to God. It's born, but it's caught up to God, as he said. He's ready to devour it, and the woman fled into the wilderness. She left that particular scene where she was, and fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God to feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score years. Now note, before we get into further explanation on this, he sees a second sign, verse 4. There appeared another sign in heaven, behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns. I was talking about pre-earth life. Now what does heads and horns mean? You take that statement and you look elsewhere in the book of Revelation, you find that it describes Babylon on this earth. It describes Babylon on this earth. A horn is a symbol of power, of political power. A horn, a head then is, is uh, uh, maybe a part of a greater system. Like in Great Britain, you've got some horns plus the head, the whole system. You see that? And uh, the point is here that a system of Babylon, because this is the same, uh, the same uh, expression, the same descriptive statement applied now to the spirit world that John applies to Babylon on earth in the last days. You see that? And that tells us then that, that not only did you have a, a battle then to over agency in pre earth life, but you had a battle to establish Zion. And the forces then were actually a Babylon source. They dissipated themselves in their first estate. And when you dissipate yourself, you lose the spirit of the Lord, and you don't have the confidence in yourself that you ought to have. When you dissipate yourself, you look for security 
and you look for a political program that will coddle you from the womb to the tomb. And the evidence, then, of the lack of the Spirit is the growth of a welfare state. That's the evidence of it. If you've got that virile independence that comes from the light of Christ in your life and the manhood of Christ, you don't want to have to report to Washington. You want Washington to sustain you in your rights and mediate on the principle of justice and equity if there's any conflict between you and someone else, and you want to have them take care of interstate and the inter, uh, interstate relationships and take care of getting the highways and coins and money and let you alone because you are living above the law. You are living in an order of things of truth and dignity where you don't have to have your problems solved by some elite body in Washington. And that's a commentary itself on our day. Now that kind of thing happened in Creole's life, see. And there were those then who, when it came to this decision of coming to mortality, who said to Satan, to Lucifer, you're a great personality, you think like we think. And by that time he was thinking like they thought. Prior to that, then, he was in a state, then, where he acquired great light and knowledge from the Lord. He was called the Son of the Morning, as the second-born male spirit of this eternity. And he was called, then, the Son of the Morning. He had orator. He had power. He had power of personality. He had power of oratory. And he learned to manipulate and to control and to center things on himself and to build himself up. So that when it came down to the issue, he says, now, I'll do it, therefore, your honor, the Father's honor, you give to me. You see that? And he subverted the whole order of life, see? But Babylon existed there. Babylon existed, and we fought the warfare in the pre-earth state on the basis of finally destroying the power of the adversary. And it goes on as it talks about that. And it says, The dragon prevailed not against Michael, verse 7, neither the child nor the woman, which was the church of God, who had been delivered of her pains and brought forth the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Neither was their place found in heaven for the great dragon who was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and also called Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And then John says, in a state of glory and ecstasy, he says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, in the pre-earth state, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. They built Zion. They established it. They built the kingdom of God politically. They established it. They threw out Babylon. And they established righteousness and the glory of God. In the first estate then was made manifest in great power and in great glory, and great rejoicing followed, as he indicates here. The accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now that's the scene of the war in heaven, see? And that is also a type and shadow of what's got to happen again. When you get to the, the application, and that's the rest of the chapter, it won't take time to read it, don't have it in two minutes. But that thing, that's, that's, the, that's the scenario in the rest of the chapter. And as it applies to our day, there's going to be a warfare against Zion. And out of that warfare, Zion will be born. Mount Zion will be born. Out of that warfare, the power of God in great glory will begin to rest upon the saints. Out of that, out of, in that era of, tur of turmoil and truth, the truth of God will be taught in great power. And the kingdom of God will begin to be developed. And those then who remain faithful receive the higher blessings of the holy priesthood and the sealing powers. And as a result of that, they'll be crowned with, with the glory of God in great power. <clears throat> and the opposition that comes against them, one of which is the latter-day Assyrian spoken of in 2 Nephi chapter 20, which is Isaiah 10, will be turned back, as Isaiah says, by reason of the anointing. The powers of the Spirit are going to finally come into operation, as they did with Enoch. And Zion will stand, and we'll build this thing up. The ten tribes will return. 
They will be crowned with glory, not return to receive the gospel. Section 133 says they're going to return to be crowned with glory. By then, the saints will be endowed with glory themselves. And then you'll select the 144,000 high priests of the great holy of the, of, the, of the holy order. And their mission will be primarily to gather people into the church of the firstborn. When that's done, then Christ will put the capstone on them, make them kings and priests in actual fact. And then you have to gather all dispensations into one, a completed one, by the way, and that's why Adam on Diamond has to follow his coming to his temple, because you're not going to gather all dispensations into a Gentile church. It's got to be into a completed Zion with a capstone on it, see. And about that same time of the Adam on Diamond Council, or shortly thereafter, then the great scenario of Jerusalem will take place, the opening of the, the sixth plague, where the nations of the earth are gathered against Jerusalem and uh, where the Jews are, are delivered. And all of that is prefigured and shown in pre-earth life, so that as Zion is built up and as the adversary comes against the church of Christ in Jerusalem, then they flee to Zion for a period of time of 1,260 days or three and a half years or 42 months. And they flee to Zion not because they're cowards, but they flee to Zion because they know that they have got to develop the spiritual power and strength in their lives necessary to whip the devil and to throw him out. And so they come here to get that added strength and power, and after that three and a half years or that 42 months or uh, in that period of time, then Christ says, okay, now it's finished. Now we've got the basis. Now we've got the foundation where I can exert my power and deliver my people. And then he will take those, some from Zion, with him to Jerusalem, stand upon the Mount of Olives, institute the resurrection, convert the Jewish people, bring them into the kingdom, as the prophet Joseph said on at least a couple of occasions, will be a great council of God held at Jerusalem in which the two orders of God's millennial kingdom will be established. The Jews will be cleansed and sanctified, the temple rebuilt, and the ordinance is given. And then when that's taken place and his law is established in Jerusalem, then he comes in his glory in the clouds of heaven to cleanse the earth and all of that. Well, that has its all its scenario. Let me just take a minute then. It, it, it has its basis then in these pre-earth councils. And there was first of all the council of the gods, and then there was a council where you made the announcement of the decisions that were made by the council of, of, in the, of the gods. Which council Lucifer bolded, and many who were in high positions with him. And they carried their case to the people, and as the organizational council was held in each spirit world, they were passing out literature outside of Temple Square, and, and promoting their program, and the war in heaven got underway. And then after the war in heaven got underway and was finally over with, then the prophet says this in the teachings of page 158. He says, The Father called all spirits before him at the creation of man and organized them. That organization wasn't the organization of the spirit. It's organizing in relation to when they're going to come to earth. He, Adam, is the head who was told to multiply. The teachings, page 181, for example, he says, at the first organization, and there's interesting significance in that word first, as the first organ at the first organization we we're all present and saw the Savior chosen and appointed and kind of salvation made, and we sanctioned it. Now the Lord acts on the basis as though you're going to do what you have the potential to do, and so when he organized the spirits in relation to coming to the earth, he did it on that premise. And then where people coming to mortality in the darkness of mind fell short. And where women then said, hey, I'm going to be liberated and I'm supposed to have, by according to pre-earth appointments, uh, uh, six, eight kids, but I'm going to be satisfied with a couple, then the Lord has to make the adjustments. And so there are subsequent organizations, you see then. The first organization is made on the premise of what we could do with the right exercise of our agency. And there's a continual modification of that right on down, and it's going on continually, see. But with that, then, you finally get things in gear, and the Lord blesses to be a part of that. And thank you for your attention. I'm sorry I haven't got in gear this morning very much. Uh, I hope I can do a little better this afternoon. I just want to leave you my testimony that we're talking about the truth, and it's a highly significant thing in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Go ahead.
don't ask those questions. Why did Jesus need to have a mortal mother? And the answer is to get immortality, that he was also sanctified. Uh, I don't know that Mary was sanctified, like the Catholics say, you know, that, that she was this immaculate conception thing. But Jesus was sanctified, the embryo was. But he had to get here. And Mary was selected as a very choice, one of the true leading spirits, female spirits. In fact, the leading female spirit of the prior state was Mother Mary. I want to know what element it was that changed Adam, and I think we talked about that and said I didn't know. He spoke about his ministry to terrestrial worlds. Are all of God's worlds like ours capable of producing celestial, terrestrial, and celestial people? Yeah, they are. They are. Uh, so that there is an assortment and there is a shift in a, and, a, and a, an allocation of worlds according to the degree of glory a person receives in, in the resurrection and the judgment that takes place. I've heard you discuss the third part of God's children that follow Lucifer, what are the other two parts? And I don't actually give you the answer to that one, but in as much as this earth is the redemptive earth, are there any blessings available to saints here that aren't available to saints in other worlds? And the answer to that is yes. And that is a good picture and a detailed and an interesting one. Are the Lamanites of this uh, uh, genetic seed born of his seed. I don't quite get uh, the meaning. Are the Lamanites of his genetic seed, born of his seed? Well, they're, they're of Israel. They have, uh, and I hope I can, maybe I can get in that, read, read the Romans 9 and 4, uh, the doctrine of election. They're part of that. They have a calling and election to become, to see the right to be born again. They have that by birth, by blood. And so they're part of that program. Maybe if whoever wrote this would come up, we could say a little word about it. I think that's about it, at least as much as I think maybe we ought to say. Thank you.